works so well. The seminary class, we took the story that you just heard read in the gospel and did a study on it years ago at Virginia Seminary in Alexandria. And uh, uh, the, 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 the result of that study, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll spare you all the detail. I'll spare you all the Jewish points of law about when a man dies, the brother's supposed to marry the, the, the uh, wife so that the woman uh, stays alive in a very patriarchal society. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you all of that, that the Sadducees are very conservative. Uh, they did not believe in the afterlife. This whole uh, story is a setup to, to Jesus. Uh, you see, they're trying to discredit him. They're trying to ridicule him publicly. And this is how, in the Jewish world, you did that. Jesus has lots of people he's teaching. They come up and they have this trick question. And they're going to kind of trap Jesus uh, in this moment and just publicly discredit him. And they really have him on this. So they, they, they pose this uh, scenario. And this is not seven brides for seven brothers. This is one poor woman making her way through seven brothers. Can you imagine? Uh, and then they say, you know, with that uh, snarky tone that you can even get from the Greek, uh, well, Lord, in the resurrection of the just, which we don't really believe in, uh, whose wife will she be? And uh, our answer as mature seminary students years ago was to say, no one's. Professor said, why? And we said, who wants to marry a tart like this? My God, the black widow of the Bible, right? She buys the toothpaste for all of her husbands and they all die? Don't you find that a bit suspicious? I mean, give me a break. No one would get within 50 heavenly miles of this woman. Um, uh, that was a rather immature answer, uh, actually. But the truth of the matter is that I've been working on this one for years and years and years. Now I want to tell you that when I said we're back in the baptismal uh, business, I meant it. And I mean it because in these past weeks and months, I have been exposed to more death and dying than I have seen in any other time previously in my ministry. God is turning a page and people are dying. All around us. I've been with people repeatedly when they are faced with that moment where they understand that it's them. They are mortal and they are going to die. It's a really interesting moment to be with somebody. And I will tell you that I've spoken more about heaven and I have examined the scriptures to put Jesus to the test. What does he say, really, about what happens when we die? It doesn't hold up. Can I put my trust in what Jesus really says? Can I trust God enough to face that moment with dignity, with grace, and with strength? And as I reflected on this, I really did see some of the beautiful pictures that Jesus actually uh, provides. He uses some of the most powerful imagery of his time. For instance, he images heaven as a mansion. He tells his friends that he's going first into death so that they can follow. What's he always say? Follow me. He's going to this beautiful mansion. Now, the people he's speaking to can see the mansions literally as he's teaching up on the hills surrounding the temple in Jerusalem. They're magnificent structures, just like our mansions today. Magnificent structures. None of those people had ever been inside. They could only imagine how warm it was, how safe it was, how luxurious it must be to be inside one of the biggest houses they could ever imagine. And Jesus says, I'm going because we're going to prepare a place for you. You have a room reserved. You're going to come home to God's big house. When you die, Jesus said, it's like coming home. It's one of the most striking images to people that lived in hovels 
or some of them with no roof at all over their heads. Heaven is like that. It's like coming home. Beautiful gate, and you're safe. The second image that Jesus uses as I examine the Bible is the image of the wedding feast. I had the privilege of attending a Palestinian Christian wedding when I lived in the Holy Land years ago. It was a three-day event. Everything stopped in the village. Rene is the name of the village just outside of Nazareth. Everything stopped. The wedding was only four hours long. The reception was a day and a half. I'm not joking. Eighty-five-year-old women dancing for hours with their four-year-old great-grandchildren. And I mean dancing like drenched in sweat, the way good worship should be. Everything uh, available and alive and tingling. They're dancing. They are celebrating. They are trilling with that, ooh, that high uh, Semitic yell. And they're having a ball. Wave after wave of food are coming out. You have to take a break from dancing and then eat. And then you hurt from that. So you go dance and then that hurts. You come back and you eat some more and that hurts. And the best food anybody ever eaten at this, at this reception. It was a festival and a feast. I never understood what a feast really meant. I was exhausted. This was a lifetime moment for this couple. It propelled them for the rest of their lives. And the point was, even in those days, not too long ago, that everyone was safe enough and they had enough food to actually stop and say thank you to the Lord and celebrate and party. And Jesus said, heaven is like a, a wedding banquet. I mean, it's one of the most striking moments that anybody had ever experienced that he was uh, speaking to. They could instantly remember the few times most of those people were used to taking the crumbs off the table. It's kind of like being in a party in Beaver Creek or Cordillera. You know, if you're a clergy, if you ever noticed this, I, even recently at parties, I hang out with the catering staff. You know why? Because they're going to eat awesome after you leave. <laughs> you know, I'm best friends with all the caterers in the valley because it is magnificent when you leave. And, and except the people in Jesus' time were not eating out of pleasure luxury, they were eating to survive. And Jesus says, oh no, 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 no. You don't get the crumbs that's left. You have a seat at the table. You're reserved. You're the one being served. It's an absolutely overwhelming experience to be served like that. Jesus says, this is what heaven is like. And he promised, as he promises Bryce today, that there's a little seat at that banquet table just for her. The third image is one that's harder to find, and it's harder to understand. It's the image today, in today's gospel reading. Did everybody see heaven? <laughs> oh, boy, people that are married are going to love this. Um, Jesus says to the Sadducees, in between the lines, can you hear it? You don't get it. You're arguing about law and technicality and process. Kind of sounds like someone trying to sign up for the Affordable Care Act and looking on a website hoping it works. Jesus says, you don't get it. He said, there's no Mr. and Mrs. Angel in heaven. He said, in heaven, there's no marriage. There's no giving in marriage. What's he saying? I've spent my whole adult life, over 21 years, practicing the improvisational jazz that is marriage. And I'm starting to barely understand this. He's saying that in heaven, everyone is relating with the warmth the intimacy, the peace, the joy, and the respect that husbands and wives should enjoy in their marriage. You see, marriage was considered a long time ago a sacred institution. 
I know it's so anachronistic that Jesus was pointing to a life that's supposed to be better with your partner than it is on your own. And he's saying, when people die, you don't bring your spouse to heaven. Jesus is the spouse. You look God face to face, and after that, you have to treat everybody the way that God has loved you. He said to the Sadducees, you don't even get it. He said to really immature seminary students a long time ago, you don't really get it. Maybe he might say to some of us, you don't really get it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine a marriage where those words that you did not mean to say and they came out and you wish you could reach and grab them out of the air and pull them back in your mouth, those words never were spoken. Can you imagine a feeling of being received as God's greatest gift as a spouse or a friend? Can you imagine a world in which all of our friendships, married, single, all of our family, that family moment that was so hurtful never happened? Can you imagine? Can you imagine that that one person that is an obstacle to God, living or dead, that one person that we cannot forgive or let go of or forget, they have us and it hurts. Can you imagine a world in which that person is not an obstacle, but a blessing and a companion? That is the heaven that Jesus is describing. And he finally says, God is not God of the dead. God is God of the living. That the people who have died are alive with God. Friends, I came here today to tell you the good news. That heaven is real. It's a magnificent place. It's a place like a mansion. It's a place like a banquet. It's a place like the best, most awesome marriage you can possibly imagine all the time, 24-7. It's a place where God is alive. Jesus is alive. The ones we love are alive in God. And today we have the privilege of welcoming Bryce into that family. She has a seat at the table. May I tell you that this is the most sacred thing a church can do. To welcome a new soul. And God says, I'll take her for her entire life and all the time afterwards. And I prayed about her. And I want to tell you, this is a tough gospel. If she reads it in future years, she better have a commentary. <laughs> this woman married seven guys? What? What is that? Is it family dysfunction? That's not the point. The point is, Jesus says, God is God of I wonder if perhaps Bryce will experience a life by joy, peace, grace, everything that God promises in Jesus. I wonder if God will share those gifts through her to many people. I think he will. And I'm so excited to baptize her today. Friends, shall we continue our service then and watch God expand our family? I'm going to ask uh, the Hasselbacks to bring Bryce up.